Hello everyone. In the last video, we have heard the chapter one of the story Alice in Wonderland. And today we are going to hear the chapter two. And let's get started. Chapter two, the pool of tears. Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that for the moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye feet. For when she looked down at her feet, they seemed to be almost out of sight. They were getting so far off. Oh, my poor little feet. I wonder who will put on our shoes on stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I sha'n't to be able. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can. But I must be kind to them, thought Alice, or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to go. Let me see, I'll give them a new pair of boots every Christmas. And she went on planning to herself how she would manage it. They must go by their carrier, she thought. And how funny it'll seem sending presents to one's own feet. And how odd the directions will look. Alice's right foot, Esquire, her truck, near the fender with Alice's love. Oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. Just when her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now more than nine feet high, and she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side, to look through into the garden with one eye, but to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Alice. A great girl like you, she might well say this, to go on crying in this way. Stop this moment, I tell you. But she went on all the same, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool all round her, about four inches deep and reaching half down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pottering of feet in the distance, and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was the white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed, with a pair of white gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself as he came. Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh, would she be savage if I've kept her waiting? Alice felt so desperate that she was ready to ask help of anyone. So when the rabbit came near her, she began in a low, timid voice. If you please, sir, uh, the rabbit started violently, dropped the white kid gloves and the fan, and scurried away in the darkness as hard as he could go. Liz took up the fan and gloves, and as the hole was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time she went on talking. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today, and yesterday things went on just as usual. I wonder if I've been trained in the night. Let me think, was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think I can remember feeling that a little different. But if I'm not the same, the next question is, who in the world am I? Ah, that's a great puzzle. And she began thinking over all the children she knew that were of the same age as herself to see if she could have been changed for any of them. I'm sure I'm not either, she said, for her hair goes in such long ringlets, and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all, 
and I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of thing, and she, oh, so she knows such a very little. Besides, she is she, and I'm I, and oh dear, how puzzling it all is! I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see. Four times five is twelve, and four times six is thirteen, and four times seven is. Oh dear! I, sh I shall never get to twenty at that rate. However, the multiplication table doesn't signify. Let's try geography. London is the capital of Paris, and Paris is the capital of Rome, and Rome. No, that's all wrong. I'm certain. I must have been changed for Mabel. I'll try and say how doth the little, and she crossed her hands on her lap as if she were saying lessons, and began to repeat it. But her voice sounded hoarse and strange, and the words did not come the same as they used to do. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail, and pour waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin! How neatly spread his claws, and welcome little fishes, in with gentle smiling jars. I'm sure those are not the right words," said poor Alice. And her eyes filled with tears again as she went on. I must be Mabel after all, and I shall have to go and live that in pocky little house, and have next to no toys to play with, and oh, ever so many lessons, ever so many lessons to learn. No, I've made up my mind about it. If I'm Mabel. I'll stay down here. It'll be no use their putting their heads down and saying, "Come up again, dear." I shall only look up and say, "Who am I then? Tell me that first, and then, if I like being that person, I'll come up. If not, I'll stay down here. Still, I'm somebody else." But oh dear, cried Alice. With a sudden burst of tears, I do wish they would put their heads down. I'm so very tired of being all alone here. As we said this, she looked down at her hands, and was surprised to see that she had put on one of the rabbit's little white gloves while she was talking. How can I have done that? She thought. I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it, and found that, as nearly as she could guess, she was now about two feet high, and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that the cause of this was the fan she was holding, and she dropped it hastily, just in time to avoid shrinking away altogether. That was a narrow escape," said Alice. A good deal frightened at her sudden change, but very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden, and she ran with all speed back to the little door. But alas, the little door was shut again, and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. And things are worse than ever, thought the poor child. For I never was so small as this before, never, and I declare it's too bad that it is. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in the other moment, splash, she was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea, and in that case, I can go back to the railway. She said to herself, "Alice had been to the seaside once in her life, and had come to the general conclusion that wherever you go to on the English coast, you find a number of bathing machines in the sea, 
some children digging in the sand with golden space, and then row of lodging houses, and behind them a railway station. However, 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 she soon made out that she was in the pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. I wish I hadn't cried so much," said Alice, as she swam about, trying to fight her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing, to be sure. However, everything is queer today. Just then, she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off. And she swam nearer to make out what it was. At first, she thought it might be walrus or hippopotamus, but then she remembered how small she was now, and she soon made out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Alice with mouse in pools of tears. Would it be of any use now? Thought Alice to speak to this mouse. Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. So she began. Oh, mouse,、um, do you know the way out of this pool? I am very tired of swimming about here. Oh, mouse. Alice thought it must be the right way of speaking to a mouse. She had never done such a thing before. But, but she remembered having seen in her brother's Latin grammars, a mouse, of a mouse to a mouse, a mouse, a mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively, and seemed to her to wink with one of its little eyes, but it said nothing. Perhaps it doesn't understand English, thought Alice. I dare say it's a French mouse, come over with William and Conqueror. For with all her knowledge of history, Alice had no very clear notion how long ago anything had happened. So she began again, which was the first sentence in her French lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon," cried Alice hastily, afraid that she had hurt the poor animal's feelings. "I quite forgot you didn't like cats." "Not like cats," cried the mouse, in a shrill, passionate voice. "Would you like cats if you were me?" "Well, perhaps not," said Alice in a soothing tone. "Don't be angry about it." And yet, I wish I could show you our cat diner. I think you'll take a fancy to Cass if you could only see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing. Alice went on, half to herself, as she swept lazily about in the pool, and she sits purring so nicely by the fire. Licking her paws and washing her face, and she is such a nice soft thing to nurse, and and she is such a capital one for catching mice. Oh, I beg your pardon," cried Alice again, for this time the mouse was blistering all over, and she felt certain it must be really offended. We don't talk about her any more if you'd rather not. We indeed," cried the mouse, who was trembling down to the end of his tail, as if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated cats, nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't, indeed," said Alice, in a great hurry to a change. I won't, indeed. Said Alice in a great hurry to change the subject of the conversation. Are you, are you fond of、uh, of dogs? The mouse did not answer, so Alice went on, eagerly. There is such a nice little dog near our house, so I should like to show you. 
a little bright-eyed terrier, you know, with oh, uh, such long curly brown hair, and it fetch things when you throw them, and it sit up and beg for its dinner and all sorts of things. I can't remember half of them, and it belongs to a farmer. You know, he says it's so useful; it's worth a hundred pounds. He says it kills all the rats. And oh dear," cried Alice in sorrowful tone. "I'm afraid I'm offended it again, for the mouse was screaming away for her as hard as it could go, and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. Oh," she called softly after it. "Mouse dear, do you come back again? And we don't talk about cats or dogs either." If you don't like them, when the mouse heard this, it turned round and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale with passion, Alice thought, and it said in a low, trembling voice, "Let us get to the shore, and then I'll tell you my history, and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs." It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with the birds and animals that had fallen into it. There were a dog and a doodle, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to the shore. So that is the end of chapter two. Let's follow us for the chapter three. See you. Hello, everyone. I'm Daisy, and today I'm dropping by here to continue the story Alice in Wonderland. And if you have been listening to the first three chapters, you'll know that Alice、uh, followed a rabbit、uh, down a hole、uh, in the ground, and she became very small. And she tried to make friends with the mouse, but she kept offending the mouse by. Talking about her cat, so let's continue with the chapter four. The chapter four, the rabbit sends in a little bill. It was the white rabbit trotting slowly back again and looking anxiously about as it went, as if it had lost something, and she heard it muttering to itself, "The Duchess, the Duchess, oh my dear paws." Oh, my fur and whiskers! She'll get me executed, as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Where can I have dropped them? I wonder. Alice guessed, in a moment, that it was looking for the fan in the pair of white kid gloves, and she is very good naturally. Began hunting about for them, but they were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed to have changed. Since her swim in the pool, and the great hall with the glass table and the little door had vanished completely. Very soon, the rabbit noticed Alice, as she went hunting about, and called out to her in a, in an angry tone, "Why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan. Quick, now!" And Alice was so much frightened that she ran off at once in the direction it pointed to, without trying to explain the mistake it had made. He took me for his housemaid, she said to herself as she ran. How surprised he'll be when he finds out who I am! But I'd better take him his fan and gloves. That's it. If I can't find them. As she said this, she came upon a neat little house, on the door of which was a bright brass plate with the name "W. Rabbit" engraved upon it. She went in without knocking and hurried upstairs, in great fear lest she should meet the real Mary Ann. And she turned out the house before had found the fan and gloves. How queer it seems! Alice said to herself, "To be going messages for a rabbit. I suppose 
dinner I'll be sending me on messages next. And she began fancying the sort of thing that would happen. Uh, um, Miss Alice, come here directly and get ready for your walk. Coming in a minute, nurse. But I've got to see that the mouse doesn't get out. Only I don't think, Alice went on, that they'd let Dina stop in the house if it began ordering people about like that. By this time, she had found her way into a tidy little room with a table in the window, and on it, as she had hoped, a fan and two or three pairs of tiny white kid clothes. She took up the fan and a pair of the clothes and was just going to leave the room when her eyes fell upon a little bottle that stood near the looking glass. There was no label this time with the words drink me, but nevertheless she uncorked she uncorked it and put it to her lips. I know something interesting is sure to happen, she said to herself. Whenever I eat or drink anything, so I just see what this bottle does. I do hope it'll make me grow large again. For really, I'm quite tired of being such a tiny little thing. It did so indeed, and much sooner than she had expected. Before she had drunk half the bottle, she felt her head pressing against the ceiling and had still stood to save her neck from being broken. She hastily put down the bottle, saying to herself, That's quite enough. I hope I shan't grow any more. That is it. As it is, I can't get out at the door. I do wish I hadn't drunk quite so much. Alas, it was too late to wish that. She went on growing and growing and very soon had to kneel down on the floor. In another minute, there was not even room for this, and she tried the effects of lying down with one elbow against the door and the other arm curled around her head. Still, she went on growing and, as a last resource, she put one arm out of the window and one foot up the chimney and said to herself, Now I can do no more whatever happens. What will become of me? Luckily for Alice, the little magic bottle had now has its full effect and she grew no larger. Still, it was very uncomfortable and as there seemed to be no sort of change of her ever getting out of the room again, no wonder she felt unhappy. It was much pleasanter at home, thought poor Alice, when one wasn't always growing larger and smaller and being ordered about, ordered about by mice and rabbits. I almost wish I hadn't gone down of that rabbit hole. And yet, and yes, it's rather curious, you know. I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened. Now here I am in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. That there ought. And when I grow up, I'll write one, but I'm grown up now, she added in a sorrowful tone. At least there's no room to grow up any more here. But then, thought Alice, shall I never get any older than I am now? That'll be a comfort one way, never to be an old woman, but then always to have lessons to learn. Oh, I shouldn't like that. Oh, you poor list, Alice, she answered herself. How can you learn lessons in here? Why, there's hardly room for you and no room at all for any lessons books. And so she went on, taking first one side and then the other, and making quite a conversation of it altogether.
But after a few minutes, she heard a voice outside, and stopped to listen. Mary Ann, Mary Ann," said the voice. "Fetch me my clothes this moment." Then came a little pattering of feet on the stairs. Alice knew it was the rabbit coming to look for her, and she trembled till she shook the house. Quite forgetting that she was now about a thousand times as large as a rabbit, and had no no reason to be afraid of it. Presently, the rabbit came up to the door and tried to open it, but as the door opened inwards, and Alice's elbow was pressed hard against it, that attempt proved a failure. Alice heard it say to itself. Then I'll go round and get in at the window. That you won't, thought Alice. And after waiting till she fancied she heard the rabbit just under the windows, she suddenly spread out her hand and made a snatch in the air. She did not get hold of anything, but she heard a little shriek, and a fall, and a crash of broken glass. From which she concluded that it was just possible it had fallen into a cucumber frame or something of the sort. Next came an angry voice, the rabbit's. "Pat, Pat, where are you?" And then a voice she had never heard before. "Sure, then I'm here, digging for apples, Your Honor." "Digging for apples, indeed," said the rabbit angrily. Here, come and help me out of this. Sounds of more broken glass. Now tell me, Pat, what's that in the window? I'm sure it's an arm, Your Honor. An arm, you goose! Who ever saw one that size? Why, it fills the whole window. Sure, it does, Your Honor. But it's an arm for all that. Well. It's got no business there. At any rate, go and take it away. There was a long silence after this, and Alice could only hear whispers now and then, such as, "Sure, I don't like it, Your Honor, at all, at all." Do as I tell you, you coward. And at last, she spread out her hand again, and she made another snatch in the air. This time there were two little shrieks, and more sounds of broken glass. What a number of cucumber frames there must be! Thought Alice. I wonder what they'll do next. As for pulling me out of the window, I only wish they could. I'm sure I don't want to stay in here any longer. She waited for some time without hearing anything more. At last came a rumbling of little car wheels, and the sound of a good many voices all talking together. She made out the words, "Where's the other ladder? Why I hadn't to bring but one. Bill's got the other. Bill, fetch it here, lad. Here, put them off this corner." No, Tim. Talk together first. They don't reach half high enough yet. Oh, they'll do well enough. Don't be particular. Here, Bill, catch hold of this rope. Will the roof bear? Mind that loose slate. Oh, it's coming down. Has blow. A loud crash. Now, who did that? It was Billy. I fancy. Who's go to down the chimney? I shan't you do it. That I want, then, Bill's to go down. Here, Bill. The master says you're going to down the chimney. So Bill's got to come down the chimney, has he? Said Alice to herself. Shy, they seem to put everything upon Bill. I wouldn't be in Bill's flakes for a good deal. This fire flakes is narrow, to be sure, but I think I can kick a little. She drew her foot as far down the chimney as she could, and waited till she heard a little animal. She couldn't guess what sort of it was, scratching and scrambling about the chimney close above her, then saying to herself, 
This is Bill. She gave one sharp kick and waited to see what would happen next. The first thing she heard was a general chorus of "There's go Bills. Then the rabbit's voice along catch him, you by the hedge. Then silence and then another confusion of voices. Hold off his head, Brandy now, don't choke him. How was it, older fellow? What happened to you? Tell us all about it. Last came a little feeble, squeaking voice. That spill, thought Alice. Well, I hardly know. No more, thank you. I, I, I'm better now, but I'm a deal too flustered to tell you. All I know is something comes at me like a jack in the box, and up I goes like a skyrocket. So you did, old fellows," said the others. "We must burn the house down," said the rabbit's voice, and Alice called out as loud as she could. "If you do, I'll set dinner at you." There was a dead silence instantly, and Alice thought to herself, "I wonder what they will do next." If they had any sense, they'd take the roof off. After a minute or two, they began moving about again, and Alice heard the rabbit say, "A barrelful will do to begin with." A barrelful of what? Thought Alice, but she had no, but she had not long to doubt, for the next moment, a shower of little pebbles came rattling. In at the window, and some of them hit her face. I'll put a stop at this, she said to herself, and shouted out, "You'll better not do that again." Which produced another dead silence. Alice noticed with some surprise that the pebbles were all turning into little cakes as they lay on the floor, and a bright idea came into her head. If I eat one of these cakes, she thought, it's sure to make some change in my size, and as it can't possibly make me larger, it must make me smaller, I suppose. So she swallowed one of the cakes, and was delighted to find that she began shrinking directly. As soon as she was small enough to get through the door, she ran off the house and found quite a crowd of little animals and birds waiting outside. The poor little lizard's bill was in the middle, being held up by two junior pigs, who were giving it something out of a bottle. They all made a rush at Alice. The moment she appeared, but she ran off as hard as she could, and soon found herself safe in a thick wood. The first thing I've got to do," said Alice to herself, as she wandered about in the wood, "is to grow to my right size again, and the second thing is to find my way into that lovely garden. I think that will be the best plan." It sounded an excellent plan, no doubt, and very neatly and simply arranged. The only difficulty was that she had not the smallest idea how to set about it. And while she was peering about anxiously among the trees, a little sharp bark just over her head made her look up in a great hurry. An enormous puppy was looking down at her with large round eyes, a feeb feebly stretching out one paw, trying to touch her. Poor little thing," said Alice, in a coaxing tone, and she tried hard to whistle to it, but she was terribly frightened all the time at the thought that it might be hungry, in which case it would be very likely to eat her up in spite of. All her coaxing, hardly knowing what she did, she picked up a little bit of stick and held it out to the puppy. Whereupon the puppy jumped into the air of all its feet at once, with a yelp of delight, and rushed at the stick.
and made believe to worry it. Then Alice dogged behind the red thistle to keep herself from being run over. In the moment she appeared on the other side, the puppy made another rush at the stick. And tumbled head over heels, in its hurry to get hold of it. Then Alice, thinking it was very likely having a game of playing with a cart horse, and expecting every moment to be trampled under its feet, ran round the thistles again. And then the puppy began a series of short charges at the stick, running a very little way forwards each time and a long way back, and barking hoarsely all the while. Still, at last, it sat down a good way off, panting with its tongue hanging out of its mouth and it, and its great eyes half shut. This seemed to Alice. A good opportunity for making her escape, so she set off at once and ran till she was quite tired and out of breath, and until the puppy's bark sounded quite faint in the distance. And yet, what a dear little puppy it was," said Alice, as she leaned against a buttercup to get a buttercup to rest herself. And fanned herself with one of the leaves. I should have liked teaching its tricks very much, if, if I'd only been the right size to do it. Oh dear, I'd nearly forgotten that I've got to grow up again.、Um, let me see how it is to be managed. I suppose I ought to drink or eat something or other, but the great question is what. The great question certainly was what. Alice looked all around her at the flowers and the blaze of glass, but she did not see anything that looked like the right thing to eat or drink under the circumstances. There was a large mushroom growing near her, about the same height as herself, and she had looked under it and on both sides of it and behind it. It occurred to her that she might as well look and see what was on the top of it. She stretched herself up on tiptoe and peeped over the edge of the mushroom, and her eyes immediately met those of the large caterpillar that was sitting on the top with its arm folded, quietly smoking a long hookah, taking not the smallest notice of her or of anything else. So that's the chapter four of Alice's adventure in Wonderland. So see you in the next chapter.